<laughs> Not just the Mercy Watchers, but everybody. Hi, everybody. Today we have with us a fascinating scholar and deacon of the church. It is Dr. Bob Hesse. And I'm so excited to talk with him today because it's fascinating, the field that he delves into. And he's going to be teaching a class right here at the University of St. Thomas. So welcome, Bob. Thank you, Richard. Great to see you. I'm Thanks for be being here, here with us great. today. Yeah. So one of the questions I like to, to ask our guests in the hot seat, it's not so hot, but yeah, <laughs> it's a seat. I feel it. There <laughs> you go. Awesome. Talk to me. What is your definition of innovation? Um, thinking outside the box, um, paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. The biggest innovations are paradigm shifts from the classical thinking. Yeah. Good question. Though. Well, I, I, I love that because it's, you're not detailed in that and you give an, a wideness and openness, right? To let the, the, the people explore. To innovate. I mean, that's that's essentially it, outside yeah. of the, the paradigms, the frames that we normally think. And so your work and your book and your research are all innovative, right? So tell me about how um, science and faith work together or, or work in opposite directions sometimes with innovation and how um, your book, this book right here, <laughs> shameless plug, right? Um, how it, it sort of captures that, that interplay of science and faith and innovation. Well, the, the book is both a textbook and a mm -hmm. memoir. And so it was partly a capturing of my own journey uh, to return to my faith through science. And, uh, and basically, uh, I never said I was no longer Catholic. It's just that if I, somebody asked me, I would have said, yes, I'm Catholic, but I wasn't practicing for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I rediscovered my faith through science. And basically, faith and science are approaching asymptotically. Now, it's a fancy word. But <laughs> it's a word to say, basically, they're infinitely approaching, but will never touch ah. because they're answering different questions. But I mm -hmm. started to see the synergy and I ju it just stunned me. And I got so tired of hearing people say that they, uh, they are in contradiction, and they're not. And uh, that's the beauty of the excitement of the awe of the discovery as I went along in my journey. So when you said that, it, it made me think of, uh, of an image, and that is uh, a magnet, right? So a lot of times magnets will just clasp onto each other, right? But, but also you get the right magnets, and they're... They're sort of opposed. They create a field that doesn't let it touch. Um, and so I, I think what I'm hearing you say is that science and faith complement one another in, in a certain way. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they, uh, science is really answering a, a, a question of uh, how, mm -hmm. a faith question of why. But the more you understand the how, the more you start to realize the why behind it. Yeah. So there is a it's a fascinating dance. And ultimately it leads to a real appreciation for God's love for us. Yeah. That's the bottom line of the of the journey through science. How incredible. You know, that's that's one of the things I, I think a lot of times folks create in the in the sort of the secular um, conversation, this uh, opposites, right, between faith and science, and and really they work together, right? That's, that's absolutely. When I do homilies, I put science mm -hmm. quite often in the homilies, and quite often it's the younger people that are fascinated by that because they're not hearing it, yeah. and it's also the secular world that's misinforming them of the of the con the conflict between the two that doesn't exist. It, it, it's all a revelation. In, in different ways. Yeah. Yes. So one of the things I noticed in the book is that the foreword was written by Father Spitzer. Tell us about that, your relationship maybe with him. How'd that all come about? Amazing guy. I mean, brilliant. Yes. Uh, I'm, he gave a presentation to the deacons here in Houston. I listened to him and I asked one or two questions from the audience. He answered them. I bought two of his books. I went up and put them in front of him mm -hmm. for his sign. I said, well, I'd like for you to sign it. 
And it was only then I realized he was blind. <laughs> That's right. He, I couldn't believe see. it. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. And with time, he ended up writing the, the foreword. Uh -huh. And I thought, how in the world? When I read the foreword, I thought, my gosh, he, he captured the book. How did he do that mm -hmm. when he's blind? There's no audio yet. Yeah. And I called his assistant, and she said I read the book to him all day. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, and he, at the end of the day, she said he dictated the foreword without changes. <laughs> I don't, don't, how do you do this? It's incredible. So his, his mind is way ahead of mine, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> he, he is a, an absolute star. Well, and you know, in, in my situation with low vision, he's a... He's a someone I look up to, pardon the pun, but I look up to him, uh, you know, and, and see his great gifts of leadership and, and just engagement with the world. And certainly he's he's one of those rare examples where people are. are well, he asked me to be on the faculty of the Magis Center, which he oh, started, yeah. which he Excellent. started. Yes. But he he will if you talk to him privately or, you know, he doesn't tout it a lot, but mm -hmm. his loss of his sight was a, 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 a big part of his spiritual journey. Ah. Absolutely what key to his back, yeah. to uh -huh. <laughs> back to the suffering. Back to the suffering. Well, you know, and and in in my own experience, one of the things I, I I think it is a blessing in some ways because it it has made me surrender to the ambiguities of life. Right, right. So, how did all this start? I mean, what got you interested in this particular genre, field, uh, book study, all that? How, how did you get started in that? Um, hell, that's a good question. Um, I, as I said, I wasn't practicing my faith, and uh, I'm embarrassed to say that, but that's part of the spiritual journey I was mm -hmm. on. And basically, I started to run into suffering. Uh -huh. Isn't that isn't that <laughs> what drives a lot of people? If if anybody gave us an example of that, it was Jesus. How to suffer Indeed. and 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 resurrect from it. So. Um, my wife suffered from bipolar condition. Mm. Um, uh, it, uh, I saw suffering in so many places, uh, and and I started to get look for solutions. I thought I was in control, and uh, that's <laughs> we the, all, that's we the, all the, labor oh, under that and, delusion. And it, it was a late, I was a late learner. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and so in a search for not if you're going to be in control, you got to take responsibility mm -hmm. not just the good things, but also the things that. Go to hell in a basket, <laughs> as they say. So, uh, in in that struggle of of illness and not mm -hmm. seeing that I could control or help, it caused me to start looking within science. That was my default, right? Uh -huh. And then I started to see God in the science. It was uh, it it started with when I was a child, physics to creation. These are kind of the main four chapters of the book: uh -huh. physics to creation chemistry to life, biology to consciousness, and psychology to mysticism. Mm -hmm. And so that search led me in that direction. That's why it was a natural progression to end up with mysticism right. and having God's presence palpable. Mm. And it actually loops back to the physics. It's a, it's a fascinating uh, uh, discovery that I had in me mm -hmm. that led me back to God. Going back to the the beginning of, of your thought there, where um, suffering, right? Isn't it, isn't it ironic how oftentimes uh, suffering is a gateway to, to clarity, to purity, to those sorts of things? You, you mentioned certainly Jesus suffering and, and his ultimate victory mm -hmm. over death. Um, I think in, in a more contemporary space within the last you know, 20 years or so of the great witness that St. Pope John Paul II gave us near the end of his life, where there was such public suffering that he shared um, that gives yet hope always is there. It's, it's hope, but it's ultimately surrender to the unknown. Mm -hmm. And uh, and. My image of God was shifting constantly until it came to the point where it was the unknowable, ineffable. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that, that journey is what uh, was exciting for me to go through and why uh, I wrote it down, yeah. basically. So one of, the, one of the things, you wear many hats, right? <laughs> but one of the things that I, I know you are involved with a creator of, I think, is the Contemplative Network. Yes. Right? And so tell us a little bit about that and how your research on a scientific basis 
sort of informs what the contemplative network is. Well, what happened is as my journey led into mysticism and I start and I had a mystical experience, which was a blessing. It's a gift. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's not, not something I sought or earned, whatever. But I started then to get involved in teaching contemplative prayer uh, to many, many people. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was about the time I was coming back into the diaconate, studying to be a deacon. Uh -huh. So I not only came back to the church, but then I... <laughs> <laughs> you went I all thought, in. I went all in. <laughs> I'm this just going to become <laughs> clergy. <laughs> yeah. All right. And uh, so w once that started, I, I started to see the healing taking place in the people I was teaching this to. Mm -hmm. And being a scientist and believing in what St. Augustine of Hippo said was... A miracle is not an exception to the laws of nature. It merely means that we don't know the laws of nature completely. <laughs> and so I was on a search for the laws of nature completely. Uh -huh. So uh, not calling God's miracle an exception to the laws of nature, I became to I came to realize that this is the miracle. <laughs> it's creation itself. Yes. And so when I started to see all that healing, I co-founded an organization called Contemplative Network with mm -hmm. a very blessed good friend, Kim Kehoe. Kimball mm -hmm. Kehoe, mm -hmm. uh, and he was a former Jesuit and taught at Rice mm -hmm. in business school, got his doctor from Harvard in business, and brilliant guy, but he recently passed away. And, oh. and he was the chairman of the organization. I was a president, and mm -hmm. it was founded 11 years ago, and basically it's evolved now from a all-volunteer into a fundraising and effort to uh, basically pay for the research we're doing. I said, we're here in the largest medical center in the world by multiple times mm -hmm. and the most culturally diverse city in the country. And this is the perfect place to do this. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the research started at the Institute for Spirituality and Health, uh -huh. where we did a, a contract with Baylor College of Medicine. Mm -hmm. But that was on discursive prayer. The, I was more interested in contemplative prayer. Right. Okay. And so, and though that was a stepping stone and it's an evergreen agreement we're going to try to capitalize on. There are three legs to the organization. One, we teach now a, more of a oneness prayer because in the contemplative tradition, all mm -hmm. the major faiths have it. Mm -hmm. Kabbalah and Judaism, Sufism and Islam and mysticism and Christianity. Mm -hmm. And they all have very similar basis on the, on the prayer practice because it's right. in the silence that there's no dogma. And so in that process, uh, we decided to not only teach the prayer, but then do research on the healing effects of the prayer uh -huh. that are really God's effects. <laughs> mm -hmm. But we did it because we needed to convince the secular world that you may not believe in a God, but here's the research. Mm -hmm. You can't discount this as a healing tool to help people. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once the research is completed, uh, setting up ministries to 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 teach it to at that particular group. So right. we're look, we, we just finished research on uh, uh, palliative care and right. lessening the fear of death by doing brain scans on people to show the common uh, attributes of near-death experiences and mystical experiences, which mm -hmm. are almost always pleasurable. Mm -hmm. And so that re reduces the fear of death. Um, we're working on Parkinson's now, and I gotta tell you, I've seen some things happen in Parkinson's that just blow your mind. Uh, in the middle of a Parkinson's freeze, teaching a man and having him go side, go down and be quiet out of his freeze. It's uh -huh. called a freeze in Parkinson's. Oh, really? And so uh, there's healing taking effect. It's not a cure, mm -hmm. but it helps people deal with their illness. Uh, depression, my wife was bipolar. Mm -hmm. I saw it in her. So God was calling us to do something bigger than <laughs> Right. Bigger than Bob because Bob was <laughs> the center of the universe before, and now suddenly it, it was, was no the longer. universe of Bob. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that that was uh, one of the questions that I had was the the research and and it's you know are, are there any other examples? You get us a couple already, right? Where the the research is showing a. Um, a, a correlation, and in some cases a causation, perhaps of a healing event or healing moments, or, or the situation becoming better for the person. Are there mm -hmm. any others that you can think well, of? Well, PTSD that is a good example. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I taught it to ten people one time. I it, and I've been doing it for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it was in the Trappist tradition. I learned it at a Trappist monastery. Oh. It, Father Keating was my mentor mm -hmm. at that, and so uh, I learned it there. 
and uh, been teaching it to a lot of different people. So I've been, I taught it to 10 people. And uh, a few months later, a man, I ran into a man with, I had taught it to. I didn't know him that well. I said, how's it going? Uh -huh. And he said, well, something serious happened. During the prayer, I suddenly became fully aware of what happened to me in Vietnam. Oh. Now, I didn't question the details. It was right. clearly a PTSD uh -huh. moment. And I said, what did you do? Well, he did what the heart of the prayer is, and it's not mm -hmm. rocket science. It's uh -huh. basically you choose a sacred word or image, and preferably a word if you're a beginner, mm -hmm. and you go silent for 20 minutes, and every time you become aware of your thoughts, you become aware you're engaging your thoughts, mm -hmm. you ever so gently return to the sacred word. That's a symbol of your desire to be with God. So what you're saying without mm -hmm. saying anything, you're saying, I would rather be with you, God, than my own thoughts. <laughs> and that gives the brain, the unconscious part of the brain, the ability to download to the conscious because mm -hmm. the conscious brain now is being um, suspended of all the ruminations it normally goes through. So in that process, the person becomes aware that they're, they're able to now deal with this. God knows that they're ready to deal with that PTSD moment. Mm -hmm. And so when I told, when he told me, I so gently let it go, returned to God. Wow. I, I dropped, I couldn't believe it. I said, this is a research we should do. So we put yeah. together a research project for the VA hospital. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, you know, that that's, so here at the University of St. Thomas, we have, of course, really strong departments in theology and, and philosophy and, and, and those sort of faith-oriented uh, disciplines. But also we have great strength in sciences, right? The biology, psychology, all, all the, the different social and, and natural sciences. And to put this together in a way where research shows a nexus, a connection between those is, is just fascinating. Yeah. So one of the things that, that I think about is this research and you're being a deacon at the same time, how is that? How is that helped? Hurt? What, what is what is that dynamic like? Well, it's ironic. Uh, we, uh, I was first asked to, knowing that I was teaching a course on faith and science, mm -hmm. I was asked by the deacons in Cuba to come down there and talk to them oh, on really? faith and science in general. Uh -huh. So, like the book is only a part of it is dedicated to the mysticism and the research. But mm -hmm. uh, I went down there, and that's where we ended up doing a lot of the research. Uh, because I could afford to do it there. Uh -huh. So, and I was able to enter because I was a deacon. Uh -huh. So the Holy Spirit, <laughs> well, it was not just a deacon, but there was a, a cultural exchange treaty with Cuba that still exists. So uh -huh. I was able to go down there. But um, God has been forming me in a way that I never dreamed I would <laughs> utilize <laughs> in, in, right. in different ways. And to take you places maybe you never thought exactly. of, of going. So I'm going to be teaching the course here and yes. then also at the Pontifical University in Rome using the oh. book as a textbook. So Excellent. So. Well, that's, that's incredible. Terrific. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Deacon Bob Hesse. <laughs> so you, much Richard. for being with us today. Thank you. Thank anyway, you. thank you and God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.